Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for another Vitality Speaker Series, a monthly webinar dedicated to bigger picture issues and what they mean for financial advisors, their clients, and the wider world. I'm Adam Saville, Intermediary Content Editor for Vitality, and it's wonderful to welcome you for today's session, our last in the autumn programme. Focusing on climate change, sustainability, and the ESG revolution is a massive topic for us all, especially given the UN's global summit, COP26, which has been taking place over the past 10 or 11 days or so. But before I hand over for our host today, Premis Sohan, Technical Marketing Manager for Vitality Invest, I'd like to take this opportunity, as this is the final session of the year, to give you a heads up about what's happening in our winter programme, which kicks off in January. Our three month season of events will cover behavioral science, health and well being, and the healing power of the mind, featuring some of the leading speakers in their field. We start the year with Professor Hal Hirschfeld, scholar of the University of California, and we'll be exploring how, as human beings, we can connect our current and future selves and, and looking into the, the, the cognitive drivers that sh that behind the choices that we make as individuals and how this can define the length of our health span and even our wealth span. So that's our January session, and you can watch this space for further updates about the rest of the, of the programme and for, and, to, and for ways to register for those sessions. But for today, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Premis Sohan for today's session on sustainability and the ESG revolution and why it matters to you and your clients. So thanks again for joining us and hello Premis. Thanks, Adam, and morning, everyone. So as Adam just mentioned, I'm Prema Sohan, Technical Marketing Manager for Vitality Invest. And today we're going to be exploring sustainability and the environmental, social and governance factors that are leading to this rise of the ESG revolution. Now, it seems like right now there's just no escaping the subject of sustainability. We've all seen the news lately just filled with headlines from COP26, the UN's climate change conference. And there's been such a wide range of topics discussed, from deforestation, to cutting methane gas emissions, to the move towards the UK becoming the world's first net zero financial centre. And let's not forget the debate around the carbon footprint menus as well. But even before this, I think as individuals, we're just all extremely conscious of the role that we can play in the future of our planet, whether that's environmentally, but then also socially as well, with aspects such as gender equality, diversity and inclusion good health and well-being. These are all just as important in the workplace and as a role for businesses to play too. Even the investment industry is playing a huge part with the rise of ESG investing. So today's session is really going to focus on this evolving landscape and more importantly what it means to financial advisors, their client conversations going forward and how an advisor's business may evolve over time to really take account of these matters. So let's welcome our panel then. And firstly, we're joined by Matthew Gitchen, Professor and Director of Business and Sustainability at Holt Asher's Executive Education. He's been tipped by Thinkers50 as the global expert on CEOs and sustainability. Matt, welcome. Hi there, nice to meet you. Uh, nice to see everyone. We're also joined by Julia Dreblo, Director of SRI Services, who has over 25 years experience specialising in sustainable investments. And she's well known for her passion in this area. Julia, morning to you as well. Morning, Prema. And lastly, we're joined by Vitality C. Pat Joe Ramputra, who this year was appointed uh, Chief Sustainability Officer, and he's currently leading the company's sustainability agenda. Hi, D. Pat, morning to you as well. So before we start there, I just wanted to remind you all that we'll be taking questions um, throughout this discussion, and there'll be some time at the end for the panel to answer them. So everyone, thank you for joining us today. And to kick things off then, it's pretty clear that the topic of sustainability just isn't going anywhere right now. But what is it about sustainability that makes it mean so much right here, right now? Maybe, Matthew, if we start with yourself. Um, I mean, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Sustainability is everywhere at the moment. Uh, I've, I've been working in this field for just about 20 years. Um, and so I feel like I've been talking about it for a long time. And there are people I've been talking about it too, but there's a lot of people really engaged at the moment. Uh, awareness about the kinds of issues is really growing. You've mentioned how we're in the middle of the COP. 
um, the, the conference, the parties conference in Glasgow. Um, I mean, climate change, there's lots of issues to do with sustainability. You, you mentioned a few there, but I, maybe I'll just say a little bit about climate change. It's the really big one that we're focusing on at the moment. Um, and I think we're all just more and more aware of how serious and how urgent this topic is. Um, awareness has really been growing. We used to talk about the problems of climate change as something we'd be experiencing in the future, but now it's become an issue that we're, we're talking about experiencing now. Uh, you could think about the extreme heat this summer in Western United States, in Canada, temperatures of 50 degrees in Vancouver. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that's as, as weird as having a 50 degree day in, in London or, or, or Edinburgh. It's, um, it, it's crazy. It's happening now. And the flooding that we've had in Belgium, Germany, China, fires in Australia and Siberia, you know, it, it's, it's around us. Um, and it's great that everyone's talking about it. Uh, and I think after the Paris Agreement a few years ago, lots of awareness growing around the scale of what we need to do and how we effectively now are talking about eliminating carbon emissions by 2050. To do that really means some really big decisions in the in the next 10 years. Um, uh, talking, of, you know, and, and lots of positive things happening: renewable e electricity, moving to wind farms, solar, electric vehicles around the corner. Lots going on. So all of that public awareness, everyone's talking about it, and that's putting a lot of uh, pressure onto businesses, investors, and, and that's why we're having this conversation. No, definitely, there's a lot going on. And Julia, how about from the investment world's point of view? Um, likewise. Um, so. As you said in the introduction, I've been talking about this 25, 30 years. Um, I've always been saying this is incredibly important. This has got to be part of every decision we make. Well, that's starting to happen now. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. There are lots of discussion papers out. Uh, DP 214 um, on disclosure and labels um, will we'll no doubt come on to shortly. But from an intermediary's perspective, what we're seeing now is that investment managers and asset owners are being told they need to start looking at things particularly like climate change. But increasingly people have woken up to the fact that climate change isn't this standalone issue on its own. It's completely interconnected with everything like deforestation, with social issues, and the management of all of that is the governance piece. You can't divide these bits up. So um, if you like, climate change has been the bit pushing forward. So we've got from next year, from April, uh, financial services companies and other listed entities being told they've got to report their climate, uh, carbon emissions under the TCFD regime. So, so really, it's 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 starting with with the sort of behind the scenes actual asset owners, and it's working its way through to financial advisors. And and frankly, you know, everything is starting to shift. Yeah, definitely. And and Deepak, how about from from a corporate perspective then? Yeah, so some really great points uh, put forward there by Julia and Matthew there. I mean, I'll start off with a really simplistic statement that actually it's clearly the right thing to do. And actually, it's, it's not something that's new. It's been around for decades. You know, the world has recognized this, but it's actually become very real now and very tangible. Whereas people have kind of felt it won't affect me. It's far away. It's happening in the Far East or in the US or somewhere else. It's becoming much, much more real. And you know, there's a lot of evidence from a you know, consumer perspective, but also from a business perspective as well. You know, there's a lot of evidence and research you know, that shows that actually that the world is waking up to this. I mean, you know, the UN Global Compact did a survey uh, among CEOs and over 1,100 CEOs surveyed, um, over nearly 80% highlighted the need for kind of sustainability and everything that's underpinning it. And uh, the UN kind of uh, Sustainable Development Goals acting as a guiding star. So this is coming, clearly COP26, I think is the beginning of something new, the next era beyond Paris. Uh, governments, regulators, a guiding, supporting, you know, I, I might even add forcing this change. So it's coming, it's going to happen, and you know, we can view it as a risk or an opportunity. Uh, myself as an eternal optimist, I think it's a great opportunity, and we're, we're that generation that has that opportunity to drive, drive out that change, and I think we're going to discuss some great topics around the themes that we've just touched on. Yeah, that definitely means the whole host of issues you've all just covered there. I think one of the things about sustainability is that it, it can often be quite an emotive word. People tend to sometimes align align their actions um, with their values. So it would actually be really interesting just to understand, you know, why is it that you all felt such a calling to get involved in this area in the first phase? 
I mean, maybe Judy, if, if we start with yourself first, because like you just mentioned, you know, ESG investing has certainly become popular right now, but you've been involved with it for, for such a number of years now. So, so what is it in those, those early days that, that really piqued your interest? Okay, so I started in this area in, uh, I started in financial services, my first real job, if you like, was in 1989, graduate trainee scheme at a company called NPI, which is kind of sadly long gone. But what, what happened after literally 1991, I'd only really been out being a broker consultant for probably less than a year at the time. And I heard a presentation from some, well, from some people called Tessa Tennant and Mark Campanale, and they basically talked about sustainability or environmental issues and personal values. The fact you could have funds that integrated these things into investments. And before that, it just felt like a job. And then once I heard this, it was like, and they were launching the new funds, which are now the Henderson's funds. And it was just blindingly obvious to me that of course the way people feel about things and what we want to have happen in the future absolutely should be part of the way we invest because investments are about building for the future. It's about you know, helping companies try to succeed or, or shall we say not succeed so it was just it was just blindingly obvious to me and I just went up to them at the end of the seminar that they'd, they'd been producing these, these global care funds and said how do I get involved and I, I, I started working you know popping in and out seeing them in their offices um, for quite some time and then moved across to Friends Providence specialised in the area because they would create a job for me in that area whereas MPI um, couldn't because it was all so tiny at the time um, so yeah, to me, it was just blindingly obvious. Um, it's just yeah, maybe my thought process was somewhat um, unusual at the time, but there you go. And um, um, Matthew, was it similar for yourself or? Uh, yes, yeah, similar-ish. I mean, I think for me, I was always interested in these topics and I was I was studying them at university and I was looking to find work, looking to you know, earn a living by doing something to help in this kind of area. Um, and I was, kind of coming out of university in, in the early 2000s and um, hadn't really considered that if I wanted to work in this area that would mean that could mean working for businesses and, and companies um, I was thinking I might work in government or an NGO or something like that uh, but it was it was a, exactly that sort of time that more and more businesses were starting to get drawn into this area um, and I found an opportunity to be working in a business school and that was really interesting that business schools were starting to take on researchers in this area um, but actually business schools have a really important part to play, right? Because if businesses need to engage with this, business leaders need to understand the area, there's a really important role for business education, uh, the training that um, different professionals uh, get. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I kind of I almost accidentally found myself getting involved in, in the business side of sustainability, but it's it's really important. And actually one of the interesting things, so I've, I've done 20 years of research in this field through, the, through working at a business school and the primary area of my research is around leadership and uh, le leadership and sustainability in organizations and I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time talking with senior executives chief ex chief executives about their own personal journeys and how they got drawn into this so asking the same kind of question that you're asking us um, mm -hmm. and it's really interesting about the kinds of things you hear and you know I guess at the end of the day business leaders are human beings too and they're they're seeing what's going on in the world and responding to that and you know getting challenged the number of people I've heard talking about um, the challenge they've received from their children. I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it, it, it really makes a difference. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, fascinating. I, I guess Deepak, that's a natural lead on to you as well, having just just uh, taken up Vitality's uh, sustainability agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Some, again, some great points made there. Um, there's a lot I want to say, but I'm going to keep it kind of contained. Um, Julia touched on values. so. Uh, the one of the big reasons I've made quite a fundamental shift in my career from having been um, in the life insurance industry uh, in the protection space for nearly 30 years into sustainability and it gels with my personal values and um, I'll kind of relate it back to if you go back you know a few decades it was all about business was all about profit and I saw a great uh, meme on social media kind of citing that actually Milton Friedman is, is dead so it's not just about profit, actually, it's about people and the planet. And there's something that Matthew said, the next generation coming through, my kids, you know, challenge me and say, I'm prepared to pay a little bit more mm. to actually know that this is coming from a sustainable source or you know, whatever it may be. So th there's a kind of shift in generation. Um, also, from a vitality perspective, 
you know, we've always had a really strong purpose. Our core purpose is to make people healthier, you know, completely aligned to the uh, UN's SDGs. Our shared value model actually doesn't compromise profitability. There are no trade-offs. So actually, you know, we can do good. We can provide goods and services to our members. We can create value and share that value back. So it's very much aligned to sustainability. And, you know, the, the other point I'll make is our, our intent of being a force for social good. And with that shift in the, the, the culture of society and the world, I think consumers are going to be looking more and more to businesses around trust, doing good. So it's going to be a source of competitive advantage. And I think this is something that advisors will need to pay close attention to from an investment perspective. And there are a huge number of complexities underpinning this. And the last point I'll make um, when I came into this uh, field was authenticity it is so fundamental. It is so easy to kind of say, I'm sustainable, but actually you need to back it up. And you know, again, I think we'll talk a little bit more <clears throat> about this. So it's about creating a legacy and really protecting future generations and actually not necessarily compromising our lifestyles today, because I think that can be achieved. Mm, no, thank you, Dee. That's a really interesting, interesting point there. And and maybe if we just um, fast forward then, and, and like we touched upon in the, in the first uh, question, you know, there's been so many, so much media, so much articles coming out from COP26 around climate change. But maybe if we look at the whole picture and just think about uh, social and governance issues as well, um, where do you think we are now and, and what progress uh, do you think that's been made? Um, Matthew, I know when we've, we've spoken before, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals has been somewhat of, a, of an accurate marker for you. So maybe we can start just by ex explaining this and what it really means. Yeah, right. Brilliant. Thanks, Gemma. Yeah, and um, yeah, Deepak, you've mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals a couple of times too. So let me just, uh, I'm going to try and share my screen and just show what we're actually talking about. But if this is new technology for me, so hopefully this is going to work. Um, let me just check. Are you are you now seeing the, the this uh, graphic of the? Yes, we can. Um, so, so uh, when we, this, I, I find this a really helpful framework for illustrating this full range of different kinds of issues and topics that we're talking about when we're talking about sustainability. We talk a lot about climate, as you've said. Um, and there are other environmental issues with species, you know, species collapse, biodiversity collapse. Uh, dying out. We're also talking about many social issues, poverty, hunger, good health and well-being, you mentioned before, gender equality and diversity inclusion, education, clean water, reducing inequalities, the whole range of different sorts of things. They're all interconnected, as you say. So um, this framework helps represent all of that, um, but it also, it, it's a framework for action. It, it was developed through the United Nations between 2012 and 2015. These are 17 goals. Um, that the world is aiming to achieve by 2030. Behind all 17 goals, there's about 10 or 15 targets. So you're asking the question about how are we getting on? What, what progress are we making? This is a really useful framework for measuring progress across all of these issues. You can look at all of those 17 uh, goals and all the targets and there's indicators for each one. Um, and I suppose, you know, you know, coming back to what Deepak said before about, you know, are we optimists? Uh, are we, are we, do we get a bit depressed? It, it's a glass half full, half empty kind of story always. Um, there's, the challenges are huge. And we shouldn't hide away from that. But there's lots we can be really positive about. There's lots of positive action. We, it all just needs to be a bit, bit faster and a, a, a bit more ambitious. Um, I think that's, you can look at the what's happening in the COP at the moment and in Glasgow. There, there's lots of really positive things being announced, really great announcements ambitions um but i think uh, you know we've got a global target of limiting temperature rises to 1.5 degrees and they've announced a couple of days ago that everything that's been announced so far by governments in glasgow adds up to a 2.4 degree temperature rise um so you know that's better than it was a few years ago but it's it's still nowhere near where we need to be let me uh i can stop sharing this I can, uh, oh dear, yeah and, and and julia maybe from from your point of, of view and, and sort of this rise of the esg investing that we've seen in the last few years yeah so um i i could talk on this all day uh, which won't, won't surprise you but um yes the market has absolutely exploded it's made me go from being really busy to completely insanely busy 
Um, and what has happened is that everyone, I, th I think the penny is gradually dropping with pretty much everyone. Um, intermediaries, I think, generally are quite far behind the curve because they've been given a regulatory framework to work to and it didn't have anything to do with sustainability in it. That, of course, is, is in the process of changing. Um, we'll come on to regulatory stuff later, I'm sure. But the important thing was at the beginning of this year, the FCA was tasked with bringing climate change into their remit. So they're now tasked effectively with helping to achieve the 1.5 maximum global temperature increases of 1.5 that Matthew just touched on. So, um, so, so yeah, the, the SDG framework isn't, it's not designed as an investment framework, it's designed as a point of reference for those things that we've got to change. Um, some of them, of course, though, are absolutely existential threats. And if we kill all the oceans, temperature rises go up too far, complete loss of biodiversity, etc. those things, um, it's, it's game over for, for humankind, if you like, if we don't get that, that stuff sorted out. Um, so, so people are starting to realise this, so things are starting to shift. And I can't remember what else I was about to say there, but basically yeah, we're, seeing, we're seeing big changes. Everyone's realising it. Advisors aren't yet forced to do it, but I would expect that to be coming in, in the not too distant future. Um, I, I've been asking the FCA to, to bring, um, asking questions of, of this kind to your clients for, well, it was the FSA I was first talking to, I think about 2005, 2004, five, and they, they basically just didn't do things that were that granular. And it's now absolutely a central part of, of the FCA's um, remit and um, their business plan. So, you know, massive change. Mm. No, definitely. And like, like you said, I'm sure we'll touch on regulation a bit a bit more later. And, and Deepak, sort of from a business point of view, then how about the, the journey that, that businesses have been on? Yeah, um, I, I think it, it is very much a journey. You know, it, it's very much on a spectrum. Uh, there are some great poster child companies um, they are really making an impact. Famously, kind of Unilever, Patagonia, IKEA, Lego, a number of organisations that are well renowned for really focusing on sustainability issues. This will kind of bring, again, opportunity and challenge for advisors because the investment landscape is going to shift. Um, where do I invest? And, you know, Vitality Invest, we've launched a number of ESG funds to try and make it as simple as possible. Again, very much on a journey um, from kind of, you know, the simplistic right way through to impact investing, which is, you know, at the other end of the spectrum. The drive to um, carbon neutral, net, net zero, the roadmap itself, the timelines are very long. You know, we're, we're talking 2050 kind of, and it's hard to fathom. And just over the last couple of days, you know, COP26, um, kind of citing uh, actually 2050 is so far away. And, you know, we, we've all heard this. It just reflects the complexity, but also kind of just can potentially kick the can down the road. So it needs to focus on the short term, medium term, and the long term. And I think. Um, consumers, advisors, you know, will, will kind of be demanding more from their investments and making sure they could get, get a good return, but also align themselves to good sustainable outcomes. Um, also, just touching on the interconnectedness of the challenges, you know, and just not moving too fast because, you know, there can be unintended con consequences. So kind of saying we won't invest in coal or oil or something it's not as simple as that you know the, the issues are very very deeply interconnected and something that Matthew touched on earlier this needs leadership and leadership um, at the most senior levels but not just only at the senior levels at every single level so I think advisors are going to play a fundamental role uh, in, in the future of finance and it's not something we can kind of put our heads in the sand and say oh that's not something for me that's quite niche this is going to become more than mainstream. It's going to be the way business is done and, and the way finance and investments are run. So I, th I think, again, you know, that, that curve of kind of development and maturity is just going to go kind of exponentially up from, from my, my personal perspective. And, and just, just thinking about what you just said now, I mean, 2050 does seem like a, a long way away, but there are things that we, we can do in that short, medium and, and long term. So, so just thinking on, on an individual and on a corporate level then, what changes can we all, all make to work towards living in a more sustainable way? Who would you like to go first? <laughs> Matthew, would you like to go first? <laughs> I'll dive in on that one. Um, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll pick up on individuals and let um, Julia and Deepak pick up on, um, on others. So, you know, um, there is, there's lots, obviously, that we as individuals, uh, lots of ways in which we interact with all these things, lots of things, lots of choices we can make in the way I live, we live our lives. Um, our homes uh, are a great place to start. Um, 
insulation isn't the most uh, exciting of topics, but um, you know it's, it's managed to bring the M25 to a halt. Uh, insulation is really important. Um, how we're low energy lighting, starting to look at getting rid of our gas boilers and switching to heat pumps. Um, that's a really big and important thing that we should be looking at. Um, then there's the food we buy. There's so many different sustainability issues connected with going to the supermarket and all the different products. And there's lots of things that supermarkets and food companies are trying to help us with, the different food labels and badges like organic and fair trade. And we need to be looking out for less packaging. Then there's how we get around traveling, commuting, trying to switch to electric cars, using more public transport, um, flying. We know it's, it, it's not a big part of the global carbon footprint, but as an individual action, it's, it's a huge, you know, your, your summer holiday is equivalent to all the rest of your carbon footprint put together in, in a year, that sort of thing. So, you know, actually looking for places by train, long distance, high speed rail is a real alternative to, to short haul flying. Um, but the other really significant area that we all have an impact as individuals is through our money. Uh, and our investment and you know, pensions and, and all the other kinds of investments we have, which again is why we're talking about this topic today. Um, it's, it's, it's as important as all those other things, but it doesn't get as much attention. Uh, G, I think that's, that's a natural lead in for you then, sort of, um, you know, what changes as individuals, I guess, with our financial advisors can we make to live in a more sustainable way? Sure, um, I'll come on to that. But can I, can I just say one thing first, from my knowledge of financial advisors, um, if you haven't driven an electric car yet, do, give it a go. Um, we bought a little Renault Zoe about six months ago and it's so fast. It is this tiny little car. Um, it's, it's one we just use, you know, effectively for all our local journeys. Uh, we've, we've still got a, a petrol car for, for longer journeys because um, we haven't quite worked out all the charging stuff yet, um, but that will change in due course. They're just such fun though. I've just got to, you know, big plug for electric cars here, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> so, so, okay, with regards to what intermediaries, what can you do? So, um, Basically, none of us have all the answers on this. So there is no single section of society that can make everything change. This is one big massive mosaic or puzzle where we all have a part to play. And intermediaries must absolutely recognize that they have a part to play, in fact, more so than most. Because what they have is the relationship with the individual investor who makes the decisions to where their money actually goes. Now, I'm not going to pretend this is easy, but there are two main things that we have to look at. Excuse the birds outside. There are two main things we've got to look at. One is where money is actually directed. Is it going towards clean, green companies, solution providers, new technologies, et cetera, or is it going towards brown companies? Now, for those wanting to invest in clean, green companies, obviously, we know we've got to drive a lot more capital into solutions and companies that are driving and leading and facilitating change. For those who are invested in brown companies, what they've got to do is recognise the importance of the corporate side, which is all around engagement and encouraging progress. And there's a number of mechanisms that can be used for that, but most notably it's around voting and dialogue with companies and, and potentially some forceful stewardship activity where directors get removed from boards. By intermediaries recognising those two sides and the two things we've really got to do, which is we've got to put a lot more pressure on, on average and below average companies and we've got to drive a lot more cash towards green companies. What they can do is help direct the capital or reinforce that stewardship activity happening to help make the change happen. So intermediaries, you know, please don't think that you know, you're unimportant. You are absolutely central to helping this change to happen. Yeah, it's a, it's a really valid point, um, Julia. I guess just picking up on, on what you said there in terms of the role of what um, companies can do. Um, Deepak, do you see sort of businesses, how they can um, change their behaviour as well to, to, to help us work towards this? Yeah, absolutely. And building on the themes that Julia and Matthew just touched upon. Now, firstly, just to reiterate the point that Julia uh, framed there, you know, advisors have a critical role to play because they guide where the money flows will go and you know i had the pleasure of taking a short university course on sustainability to develop the foundations and it talks about rewiring the economy and it requires all actors within the world so all stakeholders to actually play a role but um it really kind of you know um talked about finance and how the finance industry has got a massive role to play and the government themselves have said Businesses, it's down to you. you know, businesses say we can't do it ourselves. 
Um, but you know, there is that recognition in, in, in our field as advisors, as the financial services industry. Um, we, we can't um, ignore this. I think it's going to grow and grow and grow. Uh, it can be daunting. Um, I, I think I would say don't try and solve it all at once. It's kind of a step-by-step -step transitional phase. It needs a dose of re reality and touching upon you know, some of the points Matthew was kind of uh, framing. You can't suddenly stop living and say, I'm going to stop flying. I won't drive a car. You know, that's not realistic. You know, it needs that dose of reality. So those little steps, whether it's the Renault Zoe that Julia was talking about, whatever it may be, just those little steps actually driving towards those um, transitional elements. Uh, you know, we, we need to reflect the con continuing world and behavior changes. The other piece that I think becomes fundamentally important, kind of the shared value framework, um, that, you know, we, we, we're driving out at vitality. Uh, and then finally, um, just touching upon the points that I think Julia touched on, which was around uh, frameworks. So businesses are now starting to adhere to you know, some of the uh, emerging developing frameworks. So the UN uh, principles for re responsible investment, we've signed up to that as a group. So looking out for these kind of kite marks and um, and just pinning back to the kind of authenticity point. So there's a lot that business is doing, uh, either voluntarily or you know being forced to by the regulator. Um, e either way, you know it's heading in that direction. Uh, and then just to close off by saying again, you know as advisors, you have. Um, a great opportunity and a responsibility to guide the money into, into the right places to help with change. I definitely think there, there is a lot that we can do, but I think the million dollar question is and the one that everybody probably wants to answer it is ultimately is there one group or one party that has responsibility for achieving this? I'm keen to know all of your all of your thoughts on this. Julia, you're good to go. <laughs> I jump in by, by saying, I was just going to say, no, absolutely not. People have been looking for that silver bullet for years and, and have gradually come to being a little bit more open and honest about things and saying there is no such thing. Everything we do with our lives right now pretty much is unsustainable. And if some stuff we do is unsustainable, even if it's not everything we do is unsustainable, then that needs to change too because unsustainable means it cannot be sustained, it can't carry on. So everyone has what I was doing. What I, what I wanted to jump in with and also add though is that um, with an IFA, with financial advisors, this starts with fact finding. So this starts with understanding your clients' needs and what they're looking for. And then each of your individual clients will have different parts of the puzzle, different bits that they're interested in because you've, you've got to match a client's aims and opinions to what funds do. But so long as the direction of travel collectively is, is strong enough, um, the fact there's variations in public opinions kind of drops away and becomes less important the direction of travel is right. So it starts with fact finding and processes, it goes on to research, and it goes on to, to how you make those recommendations and bring in the standard financials alongside the sustainability criteria of fund options. So so yeah, it's all, all bits of puzzles joining together. Sorry, Matthew, go ahead or yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no, I, well, I um, agree with all of that and I, um, I build on it, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, and I think you you already articulated it very nicely in, in the last bit of the discussion about the kind of mosaic of um, all these different groups in society and all having a, a role and a responsibility. Um, I think it's so I think it's really interesting. We have these assumptions. We have assumptions around individual choice and, and we can choose to take action. And we've just been talking about the roles, the things that individuals can do. But we also recognise there's limits to what individuals can do on their own. There's you know, the the thing the, they maybe there aren't the things on offer that they want to make a certain choice, but it's not easy to make that choice. Or um, you know it, you you could get people choosing to do things. We're hearing about the pressure that individuals and consumers are putting on organisations. But if you don't have enough people putting that pressure on, maybe it doesn't change drive the change fast enough. Um, we also have assumptions about governments and how. Um, if there are big problems in the world to be fixed, really that's government's job, that's what they're there for, and they have the kinds of tools that others don't have, like regulation and public investment, and you know they, they can intervene in a way that others can't. And so really we have these assumptions, this is government's job, and we've been talking about the regulations that might be coming for investment. So there are those assumptions, but also recognition about, well, we've been waiting for governments to do the right thing for quite a long time. There's a lot of things that get in the way. There's, you could talk about the, the short, the short electoral cycles, or how you know there's 190 countries in the world. They've all got different interests. They, they don't, they don't agree with each other, so they don't uh, 
uh, do the right things. Um, and I talked about that research I was doing with chief executives and business leaders about their journeys. And another key theme in all those stories is recognizing all those things. So having these assumptions that knowing something needs to be done, expect to, well, you know, consumers will ask us to it or governments will regulate us and, and make us do it. And then realizing those things aren't happening or at least not happening at uh, great enough speed or, or, or scale. And that's where it comes to leadership that, that Deepak was talking about saying, actually, other people should be doing things, but they're not. We need to step in, even though maybe we wouldn't have thought of it as our job. Definitely seeing business leaders going on that journey, but I think we've, you know, it's a journey with financial advisors to talk about how they're central in this process. It's a similar thing. Don't wait for others to tell you. There's a really important leadership role you can play in, in making this change happen and, and initiating these conversations with your clients. And I mean, uh, you know, very passionately, I, I think, I don't think it's uh, acceptable anymore to think that it's somebody else's problem. You know, that's where we've been. You know, we're we all uh, very fortunate where we are just in terms of the comfortable lives we lead and we think it won't impact us. But actually, you know, Matthew early on talked about extreme weather events. We're going to experience those if we don't, you know, do, do these things and uh, we're going to be affected by them. You know, I think it was something like 9.4% of deaths globally uh, are caused by climate change. And that's only going to grow if we do nothing about it. So in terms of whose responsibility it, it is, I think we're all kind of agreeing that it can't be sold by one party alone. Uh, collaboration is not only fundamental, but it's an absolute requirement. Um, and I think all world leaders are, are seeing that. And, um, you know, we're seeing the kind of geopolitical discussions around China, India and other, you know, other countries around the world and the commitments and the kind of equity and fairness of, well, the Western world has kind of created all the carbon emissions to date. So, I think those discussions will continue and the funding of those will, will um, you know, shape society in the future. And again, it will affect the investment world and advisors will need to kind of um, seek out options and opportunities for their clients to put, put the money in the, in, in the right places. But this requires systemic change, which again points to everybody needs to be involved in this. And I mentioned earlier, it can be daunting. It's not oh gosh, I must completely change my life and the way I run my business, etc. It's actually small steps that you know, work towards this. Um, and I think COP26 is you know, a, a great catalyst for this to, to, to drive that world movement. Uh, you know, the pandemic has taught us we're only safe if everyone is safe. And the same is true you know, with sustainability. There's no point the UK kind of having bold ambitions and the rest of the world not doing so much because we're all going to fail. So that, that collaboration point is, is fundamentally important. Thanks, everyone. Really interesting to, to hear your views. And I just wanted to also just remind our audience that you can all submit questions using the, the Q&A function on, on the chat. So please do submit them as we go along. Um, so I just wanted to change tack slightly then, and we've all mentioned COP26 in various forms. And I think the last month we've seen such a huge focus on, on the environmental aspect, but we, we can't forget that the last few years we've also seen incredible social movements happening as well. So, so how do we see the, the focus sort of shifting to this social aspect and, and what do you think the consequence of this will be? Um, maybe Deepak, if we start with yourself and its role in the workplace. Sure, Prem. Um, so, you know, the, the UN's fo uh, focus on the social development uh, goals that Matthew put up earlier to make the world a better place, I, th I think, is a good driving force for this. And it shows the need for a focus on kind of people, planet, uh, peace and prosperity, um, so it's much wider. And, and there is, as you quite rightly say, a massive focus on the E of the ES and G. Um, and the S is kind of um, often left to be lagging a little bit, but I think it is getting some attention. Uh, you know, the, the, clearly the impact of um, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too campaign, the, the, those types of initiatives have driven a lot of change. That, that we, I think we've seen good progress, um, you know, target setting with kind of, you know, women on boards and those types of things. But I think there's still a long way to go. And again, there's some brilliant research that shows diversity actually can drive you know, fantastic benefits um, in, in many forms. Not only does it help businesses uh, become more successful, not only financially, but richer in terms of its culture as well. 
but it can make the world a better place, a more just place. And it's that kind of focus on equality across the world that, that, that we're talking about here. Uh, and you know, it talks to trust. And again, we, we touched on it earlier, how uh, society now is expecting so much more in terms of trust, um, consumers, the next generation, you know, look at my kids and their expectations that businesses will focus on moral and ethical issues as much as they will on profit. Um, and they'll vote with their feet, you know, if they, if they see organizations that are, are misbehaving, you know, either profit maximizing uh, as their key focus, all their supply chain labor practices are, are, are not good. Um, we're already starting to see it, you know, they'll kind of walk away from those um, businesses. And again, it comes back to investment choices and the money. So advisors, again, you know, will, will be exposed to this. And so those measures around the ESG credentials when, when choosing investments become, again, fundamentally important. And, and Julia, do you see this being reflected then in the choice of, of investment funds that will be available as well? Um, yes, I do. So, um, so generally speaking, the funds with a very clear focus on environmental issues have, have been, if you like, more popular, more high profile. But the good funds in those areas completely understand the interconnectedness of, of social issues. So. The, the very concept of sustainability coming from sustainable development as talked about in the Brundtland report in 1987 or whenever it was, um, you know, talks about our ability to sustain ourselves for future, for the benefit of future generations so they can live the same quality of lives that we live today. The focus there was always on people. So sustainability, you know, we talk about how we look after the planet, but ultimately, if we don't, it's people that get affected. So we've talked, obviously, Matthew and, and, and Deepak both mentioned things like the extreme weather events, blood spires, etc. And we, we know that as much as it's wrong to destroy species, we do that at our peril. Now, I remember many, many years ago reading um, information saying things like, if we don't address issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, etc., the planet will be a only be able to sustain something like a, a billion people. You know, and can you imagine the unrest? You know, this is obviously fast forwarding a good few years here, but the unrest that you would have on a planet where people are seeing themselves as being that threatened. You know, we're already seeing places where, you know, people are having to leave their homes, whether it's wealthy countries like California or far poorer countries like some of the island nations and, and low lying nations that we've seen that have been affected, you know, far more extremely than ever before by storms, etc. So, so this is all interconnected and, and COVID has really helped wealthier countries like ourselves to, to understand how fast things can move like that and to understand that it is all about people. So it's made it a lot easier to come up with examples of, you know, this, this will impact these families living over here. And yeah, this is, is absolutely central to all of this. And, and, and I think the last point I'd make on this though is that as much as sort of across the board environmental issues have been high profile, my experience of talking to financial advisors is that very often um, their clients do talk to them about social issues because they've got a client who maybe their brother-in-law works in some office up the road and they do such and such that they don't like and, and, it, and they bring it right down to people issues because when you're sat one-to-one -one talking to someone giving advice, they're talking about things that touch their lives. Now they may be interested in, you know, the ice sheet melting but more likely they're going to have experience of what's going on around themselves. So those social issues, I think, have always sat very well with what financial advisors are very good at. And I think actually most of our face have probably struggled a bit more on, on, the, on, on the importance and the science behind and the logic of focusing more on environmental issues. Um, so so I, I, I think it's always been across the board, but it, it really is brilliant that the social side of things is, is coming far more to the fore. And as, as Deepak was saying, things like, Black Lives Matter, etc. If we get more diverse boards in companies, they they're pulling information from different different cultures, different ways of seeing things, and they can make better decisions. But, you know, be it different heritages or just people who you know, women as a given balance of women and men, right? But you make companies stronger, and I think IFA is increasingly starting to realise that. But obviously, there's still a way to go. 
Thank you, Julia. Um, so to wrap things up then, just before we, we take questions from the audience then, we've, we've covered a lot in, in this session, but, but where do you, you think that we can go from, from here and, and what do you think a, a change will look like? Maybe Matthew, if we come to you first. Um, uh, well, I mean, I don't know, my mind's turning to the COP again and, and what we might, you know, what might, what might we see coming out of that. Out of that I've talked about, um, I mean the process there, you know, in in the old in the old model before Paris, um, different countries had come together in the Kyoto Agreement, and everyone was given a target, and uh, that was part of the why it fell down because countries didn't own those targets and feel responsible for them. So the Paris model is that different countries propose their own targets, and then you uh, that was agreed in 2015, and then there'd be a stock take every five years to see once countries had proposed what they were going to do, what did it all add up to. That's why Glasgow is so important because it's the first time that's happening. And as I said, you know, the the upshot that came out a couple of days ago is what the world has worked out is going to do on that basis is going to get take us to 2.4 degrees warming, um, which is better than it was. But it's 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 not it's nowhere near good enough. We we need to be aiming for one and a half. Otherwise, you know, some of these low lying countries that Julia was talking about are really extreme and every, all the things that flow from that. So. Um, so you know where do we go from here i think uh thinking about what might come out in the cop in the next few days is, is there going to be more ambition around is something going to come out of the hat and, and we get beyond 2.4 or there's talk of we can't wait another five years if we wait another five years for the next time this happens then um the the it, it'll be too late to try and hold things to 1.5 degrees so are we going to see another exercise like this in a couple of years um i think we're we're on a trajectory we're going to see more and more leadership from companies um a lot of you know a lot of people have realized you can try things and do things differently and actually the world the, the world doesn't end the sky doesn't fall in you can still be a successful business and actually people people are really positive about you doing these things um so i think we're going to see much more of that um i think we're going to see more regulation and intervention from governments um it's all just about is it, yeah I'm, I'm trying to keep keep optimistic to wrap things up let's hope it's all enough um, and, and Julia, we, we have mentioned regulation um, throughout this, and, and the FCA last week did did come out saying that they will be looking to to put in place ESG rules in due course for financial advisors. But you know, what what do you think what this will mean for them then? Yeah, so the the key thing for for financial advisors to look out for is the new. Um, I'm going to read it to get the name exactly right, but sustainability disclosure requirements and investment labels. So that's CP twenty one four. So I'm on I'm on the committee that's been created for that. So DLAG, so Disclosure and Labels Advisory Group, reporting into Treasury, and we haven't started yet, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But we can be fairly certain that, given the hints that have been dropped within the paper, that we're talking about it becoming obligatory for um, advisors to discuss this area with clients, and that it will become far higher profile and much more of a, a requirement. Um, but beyond that, and, and suggesting that people don't wait for regulation because Anything like that takes years to go through. What, what we're looking at, we, you know, we're increasingly seeing that the risk of what from what um, IFAs are seen as being regular funds holding very substantial proportion of their investments in assets, which are very likely to become either entirely stranded or largely stranded. So the business case is shifting. So you need to start understanding what funds do. And I know over the last 10 years, IFAs have been directed away from actually looking at funds do. There's been all sorts of regulation that's just made them see a bunch of numbers and that that is deeply unhelpful you've got to look into what funds actually do because you've got to make a judgment call as to whether or not that fund is likely to be successful based on how it integrates um sustainability and esg and and, and values-based issues into its strategy i mean that's why we run a free free to use database on that so people have got easy access to that information but you know keep a real eye on what funds do think about your processes think about where you're getting your research from um, don't just go with other people's views without understanding them, interrogate them, look under the bonnet, ask questions. Um, it's quite, a, this, we're talking big mindset shift here and various people, including myself, are running courses on this kind of stuff. But, you know, you could do a lot worse than just starting off doing things like reading Donut Economics um, from Kate Rayworth or um, looking at David Attenborough's most recent book. These things set out the change that's going to happen. So if we know the changes that are going to happen, it's not such a, a huge leap to that start translating that cost into investment strategies. So advisors get your thinking caps on on, on that one. 
Thanks, Julie. I think that's actually a perfect time just to um, open up the questions from the audience then. Um, and we've had one come in, that, um, perhaps one for you, Julia. So, so touching on what you just said then, what's the best way to bring up sustainability with clients? Um, and what sort of uh, questions should advisors ask as part of their fact finds? And what's the best way to, to gauge the client's interest? Um, right, so I'll start by saying everyone's different. Um, sounds like a little bit of a cop out, but um, different advisors do find different ways that works. But if you talk to specialists who work in this area, you will realise they do use a wide range of questions. So what, what got embedded into the um, ISO, so the best practice standard for finance advisors a um, number of years ago, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, so ISO 2222 was um, saying to clients or putting within your regular fact find are there any environmental social or ethical issues that you'd like to oh, sorry and faith-based issues that you would like to take into account when deciding where to invest now that's quite a mouthful but it does encompass everything and that's why it was seen as sort of best practice a lot of the people i talk to will say things like no you just start the conversation by talking to people about what they care about so those sort of soft skills which are what most intermediaries are really really good at and the stuff that you can't get from kind of online systems okay so what's important to you why is that important to you and and, and then you can develop it onto questions about about your children and you know what you what your hopes are for the future so what what's not good is to put a list of 500 things in front of a client and ask them to tick those things that are important to them because apart from the others they always tick all of them so you've got to find a way of shrinking that down so what what we've come up with on our site it's been going a number of years now this um, is a style finder questionnaire just to understand the styles and the main areas that are interesting to people so are they really just all about environmental issues or social issues or is it the combination of the two which we call sustainability um, are ethical values important then you can start to work out the kinds of investments they might be interested in so start off with you know grouping funds together in generic groups um, the tool on our site is called sri style finder but there's, there's different ways you can do that but just just don't don't try and if you like eat an elephant all in one time start off gently with it with okay what do you care about and so is it more this kind of thing or more that kind of thing um i hope that answers the question um there, there's no simple answer to that though advisors you know just start off by asking what people are interested in if your processes require you to have it in writing that's a great first question to start with do you have a process that enables you then to break it down document record what your clients have said because these will be these will definitely become compliance issues in due course we're probably looking four years out etc but four years time we're talking about this being you know the decade that's all important for climate change four years time's too late so so do it now and and learn what works for you personally thank you julia and another, another question from our audience is um, around behaviour change. So um, whilst there are a lot of aspects around behaviour change that's needed, if there was one thing that we should um, we should all do that's going to cause less harm to the environment, um, what would it be? So they mentioned recycling, the electric car as well, that, that Julia mentioned as well, less plastic. What is it that one thing that would make, less the, make the most impact? Um. I, I could dive in on this. Um, I mean, it, obviously, it's all important. <laughs> it's not like do one thing and that's that's your job's done. So all of those things around, you know, you you get an electric car or, or what you buy, all of that. I'd say um, if you're a financial advisor, probably you can have more impact by this conversation we're having about raising these topics in in your in your work. Um, that will have more. That will be more impactful than all the things you could do in your own life. They're, all those things are important, but the, the primary place you could have impact is through your work. Um, and the other thing I'd say is, again, we kind of touched on it before. All those individual actions are important, and they do all add up. But actually, we need other actors too. We need government, and so actually, take it. Start, start thinking about how you vote, uh, which which parties are offering what. Um, make choices on that based on what people are saying on on climate um write to your mp uh and yeah get out and protest go on a march um, maybe even think about sitting down on the m25 don't know <laughs> that, that activism you don't see really... most ifas doing that <laughs> but, uh, i think maybe just to, yeah just to add to that um i, I think it is a great question uh, a bit of a trick question is you know uh, because there's not just one thing i think it's a combination of things which is fundamentally important but just to build on what matthew was saying i think it's a, a mindset shift a cultural shift that's needed 
it's not a case of I will just do this one thing. It's kind of everything you do in your life, the little steps. It's, you know, as I said earlier, it's not about kind of going extreme and um, necessarily becoming a tree hugger and kind of uh, you know, going to that extreme. But where you put your money is important, clearly, and financial advisors, massive role to play there. Uh, but energy and travel, I think, the other kind of components which are, are, are pretty pretty big just in terms of the impact that they can have on on the missions. Thanks, Steve Pat. I, I think I was just, can I just throw in that if every single one of us absolutely put sustainability front and centre in our business lives, things would move very, very fast. So to reiterate what Matthew just said, because the important thing is to change business so that different products, different services, different everything's available. If we all concentrate just on our home lives, it's not enough. So, so yeah, advisors, you know, for goodness sake, talk to your clients about this, get that capital shifting in the way that we know all the institutional markets are doing. I think that's a great point to, to end on. I think that, that concludes the questions for today. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for being part of our panel and being part of our discussion today. Um, and also to everyone who's been listening uh, for, for their time and for the questions asked as well. Um, so this video is going to be available on our Advisor Academy and depending on your role can qualify for 60 minutes of unstructured uh, CPD. And we'll also be uploading this content um, to our advisor YouTube later on today as well. Um, so thanks again to everyone, and um, I hope you all have a peaceful rest of the day, especially as we now take a few moments to pause and reflect for Remembrance Day. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you.